Good morning. My name is Andy. I'm one of the pastors here. Man, what a good morning it's been so far. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Darren's back there on computer. Don't look back at him because he doesn't like that. But Darren, I need you to do me a favor. Go all the way to the last screen. It's a screen that says God delights, God offers, God's voice. You'll see it. There's three points there. I'm going to jump to the very end of the message this morning. When God works so intimately and moves so intimately like he just did, sometimes it takes me a moment to catch up in my mind's eye, my spiritual eye, just kind of, would you discern with me for a moment? Um, man, if you're new here this morning, thank you for being with us. I think there's something special that the Lord has for us. Did you know that God delights in you? Do you know that Proverbs 15, 8 tells us that God delights in the prayers of his people? Do you know that the Lord desires to offer you hope? In Romans, it talks about the hope of Jesus Christ. And so this morning, if you're feeling a bit hopeless, maybe that's why the Lord has you here this morning, to offer you hope. Do you know that God's voice can be crystal clear if we need it to be? I know that I spend a lot of time helping and talking people through, and even myself through, the clarity of hearing God's voice. So, I read something this week that made me laugh. You know, culture doesn't think much of you. Did you know that? The cultural studies and surveys that are going out to the American church, if you got to read some of the ones that I receive, you would think culture... And the enemy doesn't think much of you. Because right now, culture says, surveys say, survey says, someone tell me what that from, what's that from? Come on, people. What? Family feud, because I forgot. <laughs> you ever ask a question to a group of people and you don't know the answer? Yeah, that just happened. Survey says, that the American church's listening capacity is seven minutes. Seven minutes. I have seven minutes to capture your attention. Because after that, your, your mind's going to begin to wander. Mine would do it too if I'm sitting down there. When Mike or Dave are preaching, I count how many volleyballs are in the ceiling. I read every sign. I get it. Like, I'm there too. Seven minutes. So if... Your listening capacity is only seven minutes. I want you to leave with what, the God, what God desires for the premise of this message, and that is that God delights in your prayers, God offers hope in our prayers, and God's voice is found in our prayers, and if that is true, how important is prayer? I heard it said this way this week, no prayer, no power. No prayer, no power. And there is power that God has promised. Jesus himself promised that when the Holy Spirit would come and we were baptized into his presence, that we would receive power and we would be his witnesses. Someone say amen to that. The Lord didn't set you off on your journey and not give you the power or access to the power for you to accomplish that. God didn't call you to be his child and give you his will and show you his will and not give you access to the power to accomplish that will. Man, I am preaching this morning. Man. <laughs> Unbelievable. All right, we're going to talk fast. Dave, can you help me here? Because you can talk faster than I can. My notes are all messed up. Where are my notes? There we go. Mark chapter 9. There's a moment, and for sake of time, I won't read the entire passage. Mark chapter 9, we find Jesus, and I believe it's Peter, James, and John, up on the Mount of Transfiguration. We know that Jesus took them up, and he met with Moses and Elijah, and, and there was this transfiguration of him meeting with those guys. And after that's over, they come back down the mountain, and as they get back to, let's call it earth for a, se for a second, because there's actually some commentaries that believe that Jesus actually took them up this mountain and spiritually they experienced heaven. Isn't that incredible? Like it, they experienced heaven on earth. Like they physically they stood on a mountain, spiritually they got access 
to the heavens. And that's how Moses and Elijah and them were transfigured. So they're coming back to earth, in a sense. And there's this argument going on. And Jesus sees this and he approaches this argument because he had left the rest of his disciples. I don't know how James and John and Peter, whoever went up with them, I don't know how they got the lottery numbers and they got picked to go with Jesus and experience heaven like that, but the rest didn't. So they're down ministering to this young boy. This father had brought this demon-possessed boy who the demon had so much control over him, he would throw this young man into the fire. He, like, this, this, he would go into seizure-type fits. And so this father, exasperated by this because it had happened the entire lifespan of the boy, brought him to the disciples. Now Jesus isn't there, and the disciples begin to pray over this boy. And the, the, the demon fights back, and the enemy fights back, and puts this boy into an even worse convulsion the way the Greek says it, more than he had ever experienced before. The demonic took place and grabbed a hold of this boy more than it ever had before as the apostles began to pray over him. Now these guys had seen Jesus do this. They had seen Jesus heal. They had heard Jesus teach. And, and they had watched Jesus do this. So I'm guessing they, they mirrored or tried as best they could to mimic Jesus as they prayed over this boy. And it didn't work. But we know that Jesus shows up, rebukes all of them a bit for their faithlessness. Did you know that in the New Testament, if you look it up, Jesus is amazed by one thing in people. Jesus is amazed by one thing in people. And it was either their faith or their lack of faith. It amazed him when he came upon people that had faith. And it amazed him when he came upon people that had a lack of faith, especially the Jews. We know that Jesus took this little boy by the hand and helped him to his feet after he cast the demon out of him. And afterwards, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples later in the evening, they asked him, Jesus, why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? And Jesus replied, this kind can only be cast out by prayer. I would say that We've entered a day and age in our culture where we're experiencing evil like maybe we've never, we've never experienced it before. And why, what I mean by that is I believe that there's an evil demonic presence among us that is subtle. It creates apathy. It creates lukewarmness. It distracts. And the American church doesn't realize it. We don't realize it. That's how, that's how concerning... I am as a pastor about my own walk, my family's walk, and our walk. Because it's not this walk up and slap you in the face type demonic presence. It's this subtle turn the heat up just little by little by little before you, don't real, before you realize that the water is actually boiling. It's subtly distracting. It's subtly seducing. Remember last week we talked about prioritization? It is subtly getting you to prioritize things outside of the kingdom of God. Bible study and prayer and church attendance and things that will help you to grow in discipleship and grow to be more and more like Jesus. I think the most dangerous attack we have is a subtle attack that we don't know is there. It's a cancer in our spiritual walk that we don't know is growing. That we don't know is growing. And I believe it is a cancer, a spiritual cancer, a spiritual attack that will only be fought off, will only be, will only be cast out by churches and believers and Christians who are really, really dedicated and ready to pray. And I believe that today the Lord is calling us back to be people of prayer. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul is closing the chapter, and he says this, a final word. Listen, those of you from Ephesus, church of Ephesus, those Ephesians that are going to read this, be strong in the Lord, and in his mighty power, that's important, be strong in the Lord, and in his mighty power, Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood, 
but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Church, I think we need to wake up to the fact that there is a spiritual realm going on around us. And there is a battle over your soul. There is a battle over your children's soul. There is a battle over your parents' soul. There is a battle over your neighbor's soul. There is a spiritual realm. And Paul says, listen, that's where we fight. We fight our battles in that realm through prayer and through worship and through Bible study and through community. And that's what the enemy is coming against subtly. He doesn't want you to pray. He doesn't want you to read your Bible. He doesn't want you to come to church. And he is subtly going to take those things from you. He is subtly going to distract you from those things so that you cannot be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Anybody want to be strong in the mighty power of God this morning? So what was the disciples' issue? They went to Jesus and said, why couldn't we? And I would say that the American church, we need to begin asking Jesus this too. Where has the power of God come out of? Where is the power of God happening in the American church? What has happened? I feel like we are a powerless culture of church members, a powerless group of churches. Oh, we show up for church. We hear good words, and it's got to be seven minutes long. How much time do I have, Dan? I'm out. I'm out of time, aren't I? I've got one minute. I've got one minute. Man. Oh, boy. Here's my answer. The disciples were ministering in their own strength at this point in their walk. The disciples were ministering in their own strength. When Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we, listen to that, it's important, why couldn't we cast that demon out? Why couldn't we, why weren't we able to do it? See, the American church is sometimes more focused on ourselves than it is focused on God. And at this point in time, the apostles were learning that, just like I think the Lord is going to take us through a refining period so that we learn that as well. Now in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says this right before he ascends to heaven. Most of us know this verse. It's one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible because of the promise that we have in it. But you will receive power. There it is again. Paul said in Ephesians Chapter 6, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. And he's talking about what Jesus promised in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. Has anybody told anybody about Jesus this morning or this week? Huh. In the freest land on the entire earth... Has anybody talked to anybody about Jesus outside of the church this week? There's some yeses. I like that. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Ephesians 1 is a prayer that Paul is praying over the Ephesians as he begins this letter. And he says, I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power. Let me say that again. I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. Anybody believe in Jesus? Anybody believe in Jesus? Come on, we can be more confident in that church. Anybody believe in Jesus? So Paul, if he were here this morning, would say to you, listen, Bayshore Church of Sarasota, Florida, of the United States of America, I'm sorry you have to live in this country. I think he would say that. And I think he would say it because you're distracted. I think he would say it because Jesus said it would be easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get to heaven. I think he would say to us, do you know what you have in the Lord? Do you know what you have? He prayed for the Ephesians that they would understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power, listen to this church, this is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. So what's our issue? What's going on in the American church? 
2 Timothy chapter 3, I think, holds the answer. Paul, talking to Timothy, says, you should know this. And the, the way that that is read in the Greek, says, listen, listen up, Timothy. This is important. You're going to need to know this because you are going to run into this. And when Paul talked about latter days, in his belief, he was in the latter days. Like, Paul lived his life as if, like, Jesus is coming back. Like, yeah, I'm writing these letters, but Jesus is coming back. I think Paul lived his life in two separate ways. One, as if Jesus would come back in his lifetime, and two, as if maybe he wouldn't. So he taught specifically in both ways. And he says, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents. Caleb, please listen to that one. And ungrateful. Caleb is my youngest son, by the way. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. That's not what I want to talk about this morning. Those things are all, I, we all struggle with areas of that in our walk. That's, I understand that. God understands that. I think that's why this is so important. But verse 5 is what I want to look at because I think this is the answer to the American church's issue with what we're receiving and experiencing in the Lord. They will put on a form of godliness, but they will reject the very power that can make them godly. Stay away from people like that. So Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, correct? So when the Holy Spirit was descended upon the early believers at the day of Pentecost, and Jesus wasn't just talking those believers on that moment, because we know throughout the book of Acts, in my Bible reading plan, I entered the book of Acts for like the umpteenth time this week. And I love going through the book of Acts, because for me, what I see is the birth of the church, but what I also see is the power of God moving in the church, but I also see the promise of the fact that that very power that moved through the early church in the book of Acts is here for us today in this church. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. And then he tells Timothy, you know that power? You know that power, that mighty power I want you to be strong in? You know that mighty power that Jesus promised would come with the Holy Spirit? Oh, by the way, in the latter days, you're going to reject it. They're going to push back from it. So where does the Holy Spirit, or where does the I just gave you the answer. Where does the power come from? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. You've heard me say from the day that you hired me to shepherd you that I think our issue is we believe in God, we believe in the Father, we believe in the Holy Spirit, but we keep the Holy Spirit at bay through our theology, through our beliefs. And the problem for the disciples is at that point in their ministry, they were trying to do something without the power of the Holy Spirit. It hadn't been granted to them yet. All authority hadn't been given to them yet. And so when they tried to pray over the boy, the enemy had the upper hand still. But remember, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So because of that, because of Jesus Christ, the enemy no longer has the upper hand on you. Church, the enemy no longer has the upper hand in culture. The church no longer has the upper, or the enemy no longer has the upper hand. We do, if, if we believe in it. Because looking back, I'm getting my notes all messed up. I'm just so excited this morning. For those who believe in it. I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Let me say that again. I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe. For us who believe. For us who believe. Um, Jean, Noah, and Ernie. Would you come here for a second? Real quick. Make it quick. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Just kidding. Well, make it quick. This is going to help for next week as well. So Ernie, you being the 
No, you don't get to sit there. Follow me. I'm, I'm in charge here. <laughs> so I love Ernie's heart. I love him so much. He's going to re- represent God the Father this morning. Woo! Yeah, big over here. Come on, God. There you go. Do what I say. All right. So Gene, if you would come. Gene's just a little bit younger than the father. Actually, they'd be the same age, but Gene's going to represent Jesus. So Gene's over here. So Gene's right here, right hand of the father. Pretty big task. task. So you got God the father, God the son, correct? Am I right on that? My theology? Okay. This guy, in all his charismatic amazingness, come here for a sec, is going to represent the Holy Spirit. So he's over here. So next week, this is important for next week, so we'll set it up for this, but it also is important for today. So I'm your pastor, I'm your shepherd, you're a congregant, you're my sheep. (laughs) When we need to hear something from the Lord, this is how it happens, and this is elementary. If if at the end of this you're like, duh, that's kind of what I want it to look like and be. So let's, let's reverse that. God the Father would like me to know what his will is, right? So he tells Jesus, I like that, put, puts his hand on Jesus, says, hey, I need Andy to know. Jesus tells this guy, so I'm over here, down here on normal land with the rest of the sheep. So Holy Spirit, come here. So Holy Spirit comes and tells me. Now, I need something from the Father. So as I get down on my knees to pray, I tell this guy, hey, I need the Father. I need the, the, Danielle's been kind of a brat lately. I really need the Father to speak. Could you go tell the Father that for me? Thank you. And the incredible thing is he heard it. Now, whether or not he answers it. But here's here's my issue, and this is going to be more important next week. Here's what we've done. Holy Spirit, come here. I want you to sit in that chair over there. I want you to behave. And here's how I need you to act. I, I, I don't, I just need you to be there if I need you. Just stick, just right there. And by doing that, we've rejected the very power that can make us godly. That's how subtle it is. He's over here. Okay, so I need him. You come running over here. Hey, 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 hey. Could you? And he'll do it. But here's the incredible thing. You know where this guy wants to be? Come here. I mean, this is physical. This is in real life, too. This guy wants to be with me, right? Like, this guy wants to be with me. And he wants to be going back and forth, 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 back and forth. Every morning I get up, I pray in the power of this guy. And he goes and tells Jesus. And Jesus tells the Father. Father tells Jesus. Get it? Does it make sense? But if he's sitting over there, get back in the chair. What are you doing? You're acting a little bit weird, dude. This is what we do. Oh, whoa. Hang on. He's beginning to act a little weird. Put him back in the chair. You just stay right there, okay? Because I know where you're at. I can control you from that point. This is, this is where we're at right now. So thank you guys. Give them a hand. Well done. Real quick, moving on. It's 11 o'clock. Yeah, but I used an example. One of the points they taught me is if I do something like this, I get a whole new seven minutes. (laughs) Ephesians 6, verse 18. Paul is closing out Ephesians, and he says, Pray in the Spirit at all times on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. In Luke chapter 21, this is where Jesus had just been talking about what the end times would look like. He says, keep alert at all times and pray that you might be strong enough to escape these coming horrors that stand before the Son of Man. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. First Corinthians 14, we find this term pray in the spirit again. Paul is talking about how a worship service should look like 
for the Corinthians. And this is, he's laying it out. This is like, when you, cut, when you gather, this is what it should look like. And towards the end of the passage, he says, well then, what should we do? Or what should I do? I'll pray in the Spirit, but I also pray in words I understand. I will sing in the Spirit, but I will also sing in words I understand. For if you praise God only in the Spirit, how can those who don't understand you praise God along with you? How can they join you in giving thanks when they don't understand what you're saying? You will be giving thanks very well, but it won't strengthen the people who hear you. So I was pointed to a, a, a program for pastors a while back that helps. You've heard me say that the English language really waters down the Greek. I talked to a couple of you about this this morning. You've heard me use the example of the word love. There's several different words for love in the Greek. I wouldn't use the same word in the Greek for love. I wouldn't tell Danielle in Greek that I love her with the same word that I would say I love Chick-fil-A. But in, in the English version, in the English language, we do that. I would look at Danielle tonight. I love you. Thank you for loving me. Oh, by the way, can we go to Chick-fil-A tomorrow? Because I love Chick-fil-A. Same word. Now, we understand and the definition and the, the meaning translation and all that good stuff. But this program helps me kind of break it down. And so it, it breaks it, it, it down on my screen and kind of I see the Greek wordage here. And then it gives me a better definition in the English over here. So here's what 1 Corinthians 14, 15-ish says. If you break it, like the way I broke it down on my screen with the Greek. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with my mind. I will sw sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with my mind. So there, to me, there's, there's a distinction in prayers here. So when Paul says, pray in the Spirit at all times, what does that mean? To me, it simply means, like, there is a distinction in 1 Corinthians. There's an obvious language that can appear when you're praying in the Spirit. That's not a, a, and to me, as we read the passage, it says, I will sing in the Spirit, but I will also sing in words I understand. So obviously there's a prayer language that's to be had that couldn't be understood. And Paul is saying, listen, I want to pray in that. When I pray in the Spirit, I want to pray I want to pray that way because there's power in that. But at the same time, when we pray in our minds, there's an understanding. So be careful between those two distinctions as you have non-believers around you. This morning, as I was trying to decide or discern the direction the Lord had for us, because I had a little moment with the Lord over here this morning, I didn't, I mean, I, I, I had nothing but my prayer language. Like I just went to the Lord. To, I didn't quite know how to pray over you guys and I just prayed in my prayer language. I prayed in the Spirit. I believe that praying in the Spirit is one, praying in a prayer language that the Lord may, bl may bless you with. I also believe that it's praying in tune with God's will. I believe that praying in the Spirit, you're in tune with the Spirit. So Noah and I would be in tune. Noah knows what the Father wants. Noah knows what I want. But Noah would also know that what I want may not be what the Father wants. So the Spirit has the right, and I'm immersed in Him, for him to be able to say, ha uh no, 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 no. This is how you should pray. This is, this is what you should pray for. That's, that's one of the more distinct advantages of the Holy Spirit is I go to the Lord and say, hey, Father God, I, I, or, uh, Holy Spirit, I need this. And the Spirit's like, uh-uh. I, I know right away. If I go to the Father with that, he's going to say no. So let's just park it right here for a moment. Let me tell you what I think the Father wants. Here's what the Father wants. Does that make sense? Pray in the Spirit. At all times and on every occasion, stay alert and be persistent in your prayers. Real quickly, as we come to a close this morning, I want to call us into a moment. I want us to be a praying church. And in order to make that shift, in a sense, I'm, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we're not a praying church. I believe some of you in here have really strong, active prayer Relation, or an active relationship of prayer with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And some of you struggle in that area, and that's okay. But there is something, there is strength found in community. And man, the, the devil is tearing at that more and more. The numbers of, the, of, of people leaving the American church are staggering right now. 
And the enemy is just simply saying, you don't need it. They're not leaving church saying, I don't believe in Jesus anymore. They're just saying, I don't need community. Here's what I desire for us as we shift into this fall, as we take some time this summer to look at prayer. And we're, we're going to continue deeper into this in July and August, trust me. But I want us to be a church that is alert and persistent. Because that's what Paul told the Ephesians to be. Be alert and be persistent. And can I make a plea this morning, church? I want us to be a church that rallies to prayer and fasting. Not just individually, but as a community. I want us to be, I want to invite you, there, there are going to be moments, I believe, coming where the Lord's going to lay on our leadership's heart things that, that he would want us as a church to move into, ground that he wants us to take. But remember, this is what I believe the Lord has said to me this week, that that new ground he has for us as a church, that new territory, as we move to the physical building, there's some spiritual things that are going to happen. But those moves and that ground is only going to be taken by prayer and fasting as a community. So when I came six years ago, I felt in my heart that we should do a prayer night once a month. And in the past few years, we've had moments where we've called you to come and pray for our run cities and those things and stuff. The average attendance to those prayer nights is 12. And I don't say that to condemn you. I don't say it to judge you. What I'm saying is when, when we, from, here's what I believe. As we step into the fall, as we step into the fall, there's going to be moments, there's going to be times where the Lord lays on the leadership's heart, not just my heart, but the other pastors and the elders that we should stop and take time as a church and we're going to call you into times of prayer and fasting. We're going to call you to be alert. We're going to call you to be persistent because we believe that there's something more that the Lord is desiring. There's some land that the Lord desires us to take. There's salvations around us that need to occur. So I, I ask you this church, can we be a church that is alert and persistent? No, actually answer me. <laughs> Can we be a church that rallies when your leadership calls you to prayer and to fasting? Both individually and corporately. That one's a little harder, isn't it? A church that is alert and persistent. A church that rallies to prayer and fasting. Church, I believe that's a church that can't be, con that can't be stopped. You know what's interesting is there's many accounts of these very, these, very these, these apostles that got beat up by the demon. There's accounts of almost every one of them in their ministry moving forward after the Holy Spirit came. Of them sharing the gospel, praying over salvation for souls, casting out. The very thing that they got beat up for without the Holy Spirit, they, were, they accomplished in mass with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. So let's pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Let's be alert and persistent in our prayers for all believers everywhere. Let's keep alert at all times, and let's pray that we might be strong enough to escape these coming horrors and stand before the Son. As I close this morning, worship team, you can stay where you're at. I believe that you're ministry time and the altar time and what the Lord has for you this morning is good to be dependent upon your willingness to sacrifice time for him this week. See, I could, I could usher, I could, I could do a call and have you guys all come forward and we could have a moment here and, I, and it, it could be powerful, but the, the Lord's saying no to that. I want, I want to do that. I planned on that. The Lord is saying no, which is a little bit weird to me and I'll tell you in just a moment why I think he's saying no to that. I wasn't sure I was going to share this or not, but a couple weeks ago, um, I had a dream. I guess I must be getting older now because I'm dreaming. The visions are gone. 
Those of you that know your scripture will get that joke. Those of you that don't, look it up. <laughs> In the dream, I was standing on the edge of a field, and the field had been freshly tilled, and the field, I could see the seed that was planted, and there was a wind blowing, and it rained off and on in the afternoon that I stood at this field, and I just looked at this field. I didn't understand it, but in, in my spirit, I'm like, Lord, I know that was from you. And I've been discerning, Lord, what was that? I mean, just one gentle little dream. And then last week on my birthday, a pastor friend of mine texts me this. So picture Andy. Oh, I forgot. I saw those of you around the field as well, kind of standing. We just kind of, little by little, more of you just kind of gathered around the field. Nobody stepped into the field. We just kind of gathered. Close your eyes for a moment. Picture that field. Picture you standing on the edge of that field. There's a wind blowing. Things have been good. And this, I'll just read the text word for word. Happy birthday, old man. As I pray for you, the Lord keeps giving me this vision. of a golden wheat field. You and your people are surrounding it. As far as the eye can see, there's this field. And I heard, hear the Lord saying, this is the year of harvest. Father God, this morning, I ask for persistent hearts. I ask, Father, that you would give us an alertness to the subtle work of the enemy around us. I pray that we would be a people that would be alert to it. I pray that we would be a people that would welcome the Holy Spirit in the capacity of which you have for us, that you would fill us with the Spirit. And through the power of the Spirit, may we be alert and persistent. Father, may we be strong in your mighty power. Father, may we put on all of your armors so that we are able to stand firm against all strategies of the enemy, especially the subtle ones. Father, because we believe and know that we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly place. I pray that we would be a people that understand the incredible greatness of God's power for those of us who believe it. I thank you, Father, for knowing that this is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's your marching orders, church. I believe the Lord has something very specific and very special for each and every one of you. And I could call us down and we could have a moment. I think those times are coming. I, I believe that's part of the field, the harvest. But this week, the Lord just wants time with you and you alone. And I promise you this, church, if you are willing to carve out a little bit of time to spend with him, you will be blessed and strengthened. The Lord is promising that. About four weeks ago, the Lord started, in fact, this morning, I, I know it's of the Lord this morning, I, I started waking up somewhere between 3.45 and 4.30, just awake. I get up, take the dogs out, come back in, in the darkness of the house, read the word, spend time in prayer. Yesterday, 
I had spent time with the Lord in prayer and in the word. I had final prep for the sermon. And I looked at the clock at 6 a.m. What in the world? I'm like, Lord, I had all day to do this. But man, it's been special. Such an, I, the moments that I have had in the darkness of my house with the Lord and in his word. And right now, I don't have a choice because he's got me up. I'm like, I'm just, I got that inter, internal clock that's getting me up. Carve out time. Lord's saying, you willing to carve out time? Because he delights in you. He's got hope to offer you. And he wants to speak to you. So listen this week. Take time to stop and listen. Amen? Amen. Well, hey, thank you for being with us this morning. A couple of different things. I don't know if um, some of you heard that Cheryl Stutzman was in New York, was in a motorcycle accident. I believe there's a prayer blanket on the back for her. Please stop back by there. Um, July 7th is coming. We're going to be at at Miller's Pavilion that morning for a carry-in brunch. There will not be a service here that morning, so make sure that um, you're a part of that Father's Day. Father's in the room. You're not going to want to miss. I, I feel like I'm touting myself by saying this, but there's something very special that the Lord has. He's seared this word on my heart for you. It's not a, you know, we, we usually encourage moms on Mom's Day and discipline and punish dads on Father's Day. It's not going to be that. I'm just excited. I've been wanting to preach this word for the past few weeks. So please come celebrate being a dad. Celebrate your heavenly father while we celebrate you. Amen. And if you know fathers that haven't been around for a while, invite them and get them to come. Also, we want to say congratulations to Zach and Kayla Barkema. I believe Macy Rose was born. Um, uh, on Friday, 1230-ish. Also, congratulations to Dave and Gina. Uh, I believe this is the first granddaughter, correct? Woo! You want any information, like the pertinent details? Yeah. I, heard she, I hear she was 23, 23 pounds and 8 ounces. <laughs> Just guessing. But if you actually want to hear what she was, go ask Dave and Gina. I love you guys. I do. Just go. Just go. <laughs> 